Welcome back to Historical Context. Today, we continue with our Jamestown Colony Unit. This is the third episode in the Jamestown Unit. And today, we're going to talk about the new decade that falls upon Jamestown and the new problems that come with it. Today's starting point is in the fall of 1609, which is where we left off last week when Captain Smith leaves for England injured in a gunpowder explosion, never to return to Virginia. Despite not being present in Virginia, Captain Smith would continue to write about the events of Jamestown and Virginia for the next two decades. He also would compile other writings together to make sort of a historical summary of the events of Jamestown. We have several other writings today that we can look at from the immediate period after Smith leaves to give us an idea of what was going on in the colony. And this is sort of to act as a check because as you'll recall from previous episodes, Smith was a little bit of a braggart sometimes. And if there were people that he disagreed with, he wouldn't hesitate to say things that made them look bad. So Smith exits for England and George Percy becomes the fifth colonial governor in just two plus years of the existence of Jamestown's colony. He is unhealthy and he is overwhelmed, so he immediately divides responsibilities between three men, one of them being former governor John Ratcliffe. Percy would send a group of settlers to a neighboring Dumpling Island to try to start a new settlement. But fighting with the island's native tribe would cause those settlers to abandon their expansion. Meanwhile, in England, Thomas West, also known as the Third Baron de la War, is named Governor for Life of Virginia. De La War, as I'll refer to him as, decides to operate mostly in abstention with a deputy or lieutenant governor, but as we'll find out, there are times where he is present in Jamestown. The first deputy governor he selects is Sir Thomas Gates. Sir Thomas Gates leaves with the third supply fleet heading from England to Virginia. In late 1609, as Percy is still governing, the third supply fleet begins to arrive in Jamestown, but there is no Sir Thomas Gates. And again, this is an era where information coming across the ocean is lagging. On a good day, you're looking at three months' time with good weather. But uh, in the case of the third supply fleet, they get broken apart by a storm, and uh, Sir Thomas Gates is nowhere to be found, so George Percy continues to lead the Jamestown colony. As fall continues, Percy tries to exchange corn with a local tribe, the Padawamaks, but the deal fails. Meanwhile, colonist Henry Spellman enters as an important figure in the history of Jamestown. Spellman essentially was the first American exchange student. He was in a program with the Powhatan natives where a colonist would join the Powhatan tribe, in this case it was Henry Spellman, and the Powhatans would send a native to the colony. Spellman arrived at Jamestown in 1609 while Captain Smith was still governor and the exchange occurred right after he got there. Spellman did not know he was a part of this exchange until it was actually happening. So imagine that Spellman was a very young man at the time. I believe he was maybe in his early 20s. And so he arrives at Jamestown for whatever reason he was going there for only to find out he is being exchanged with a member of a native tribe and going to go live with that tribe. Now, Spellman at one point becomes uh, sort of an interpreter, if you will. He is told by the Powhatans several weeks later, somewhere around November of 1609, that they will trade 
copper for corn with the Jamestown colonists. And Jamestown needing the corn uh, likely would want to hear that offer. So Spellman returns, and with winter approaching, food supplies being low, the trade is welcomed. Captain Ratcliffe, we remember him, the former governor, is sent with about 50 men to negotiate this trade. According to Spellman, who wrote about this account, the Powhatan disguise the amount of corn they are giving to the colonists. The colonists discover this, this trade delegation. A disagreement ensues, and Spellman ends up leaving with Chief Powhatan and a few tribesmen. Captain Ratcliffe and his men would then be ambushed and killed with the exception of two survivors. So Captain Ratcliffe becomes another tragic figure of former governors uh, in Jamestown. And these two su survivors escape and that leaves Spellman to spend the winter with the Powhatan Indians. Chief Powhatan at this point cuts off all trade and the colonists begin starving to death throughout the winter of 1609 and 1610. In fact, this winter is referred to as the starving time in the history of Virginia. So if you're ever reading a book about Jamestown or you're ever reading an article about Jamestown and you come up on a section known as the starving time, we are now in that period in Jamestown history. Little is actually written of this period of time, mainly because everybody was fighting uh, for survival. And to give you an idea of how bad it was, in the fall of 1609, the population of Jamestown was 490. In the spring of 1610, it was 60. Now, Captain Smith wrote, and keep in mind he was in England at the time, and he also wrote this much later, that the colonists relied on roots, herbs, acorns, walnuts, berries, and a little fish to tide them over. Smith alleges that a man went so far as to kill his wife, salt her, and then begin eating her. When the colonists discovered this, this man ended up being executed. So it was a very desperate time at the Jamestown colony, and as I said before, little writing exists of that winter. In May of 1610, the Powhatans lift their restrictions, which allow survivors to plant crops for the season. In the same month, two makeshift boats come ashore at Jamestown. They are the lost remnants of that third supply voyage. And on board is Sir Thomas Gates ready to finally assume his leadership position at the Jamestown colony. And you can imagine how he feels showing up with a group of 60 people who are probably heavily malnourished. Also on the third supply voyage was a man named John Rolfe. And Rolfe would be an influential figure in the future of Jamestown and in early American history. So we'll need to keep an eye on him. George Percy immediately abdicates to Sir Thomas Gates. And who wouldn't after that kind of winter that Percy and the colonists had? Gates becomes the official deputy governor under Lord de Loire. So what does Sir Thomas Gates do when he arrives? The first thing uh, Sir Thomas Gates does is assembles the leadership of the colony and look at how many days of food they have left. After doing all the counting, it looks as if there's about 16 days of food left for the colony. It was decided at that point that they would abandon the colony and head for Newfoundland. Less than two weeks later, on June 7th, 
Gates and the colony's residents boarded two ships for Newfoundland. Those loyal to Gates were last to board the ships in order to protect the town from being burned to the ground. And that is because some people in the group threatened to do this. And by the way, as this group is sailing off, they get in the boats and they sail off. Henry Spellman is still with the Powhatan tribe. So now what happens? Jamestown is abandoned. Henry Spellman's out with the Powhatan natives. And uh, Lord Delaware is in England not sure what's going on. Well, we'll find out next week on Historical Context. <laughs>